John, where are the new opportunities? Because there's a lot of uh, money going into the sector and a lot of technology. You're in the micro side, Yasser, which we'll talk about. Uh, do you want to take a macro approach to where you see the best opportunities emerging here? Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about small modular reactors and the deployment in different countries. Poland made the announcement for 24, which is a big leap in. You want to take it from there? Sure. There, uh, I mean, there's opportunities everywhere. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm very excited about is we're no longer talking about whether or not we need nuclear energy. Uh, we're talking about how much nuclear power do we need. Well, we've, we just decided 3X, or at least uh, as, as, a go as a goal for m many countries. And so then we're looking at how do we enable first movers and, um, and get, through, get through, through those first of kind uh, costs and issues and demonstrations. And, um, and then how quickly can we do those things? And so then when we think about opportunities, I'm from a, a research and development lab, Idaho National Laboratory in the United States. So we don't develop um, commercial products. Right. We work with each of these companies and many more to help them demonstrate their products. And so um, a little bit of context, 70, almost 75 years ago, what is now the Idaho National Laboratory was established as a national reactor testing station. The whole reason for that was to prove the principle that nuclear could be used to generate electricity. And then in the decades that followed, many first happened. Obviously, they did that. Uh, our predecessors also uh, powered the first city with nuclear power. Uh, first uh, principle of breeding was demonstrated, generating more fuel than you consume. Uh, things like the first new, uh, Navy submarine uh, reactor and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we went through a period, of and, and all of that borne out a commercial industry, it borne out a, a nuclear navy. Uh, but after that, uh, we went through several decades where we weren't doing that any longer. We were doing work like supporting the existing reactor fleet, improving its performance, doing things like developing the capabilities to manufacture uh, fuel and the, the safety basis performance for new fuels, like trisofuel, which was just mentioned, for advanced reactors. And, and, and a whole lot more really great things like that, but we were not uh, building new advanced reactors like we did back in the day. And so one of the things I'm really excited about, and I'll, I'll circle back to where the opportunities mm -hmm. are, is that, and it's actually the reason I moved across the country to go to Idaho National Laboratory, was to transition from so-called paper reactors, uh, or as uh, our famous uh, Admiral Rickover called academic reactors, to real practical reactors. I love the comment earlier today between Hinkley Point and PowerPoint, um, and that's exactly <laughs> what we're, we're trying to do. Now, we have not done that. Uh, you know, we, we're building established commercial light water reactors around the world, and, and uh, in the United States, an AP-1000, the Vogel Unit 3 recently came online, which is fantastic. But the, the kind of testing reactors and, and the R&D to establish advanced reactors, we hadn't been doing that in some time. So where's the opportunities? These uh, very small reactors, micro reactors that Marvel, uh, mm -hmm. or sorry, Yasser, I didn't mean to call you Marvel. Um, he we'll is a Marvel. He, we'll be, <laughs> he's not going to argue with that. He'll take it. <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about it in just a moment. These are a whole set of opportunities around things like remote communities, remote power for things like uh, mineral extraction. They're of great interest in North America in terms of applications in Canada, applications in Alaska, Wyoming, and, and mm. anywhere you need reliable remote power that you don't want to refuel. They're also cost competitive. So our first set of reactors, three over the next three to four years, are going to be what you'd call micro reactors, uh, testing reactors. I'll let Yasser talk about Marvel, our Department of Defense. Uh, is working, we're working with the Department of Defense to establish a mobile nuclear power plant for their application uh, to be operational in 2005. And then we're working with TerraPower and Southern Company on the first fast spectrum molten salt reactor ever. Um, actually, it won't be a reactor, it'll be an experiment where we'll get data, um, and, but it will go critical. Um, and all of those are just the first three and then there's a whole set of them coming after. So micro reactors, smaller systems, are providing an opportunity where there's actually a use case and a, and a customer, but also something that isn't billions of dollars that we can actually demonstrate sooner and, uh, and actually innovate on. And so that's actually an, a, an application that I'm particularly excited about. Now we still need the big reactors, so don't take my, uh, take my comments as I don't support the, the large reactors, but those are the ones that I'm really excited about right now in the near term. 
good. I mean, one of the challenges we ran, and then I'll bring, uh, ran into, is that, you know, after COVID-19, you know, budgets have been strained. We had a financial crisis 10 years before that. Uh, is there money to make like a Hinkley, you know, investment that we've seen in the UK, which has had cost overruns, so there's great concerns of proceeding, and it's well on its way at this stage. But does it hold back governments to deploy major investments, or will the trend go to the smaller uh, reactors, you think? So in the U.S., there has been a trend towards smaller reactors um, with, the, with the promise of being more cost-effective, the promise of being, uh, because of modularity, faster to, to, uh, to bring into operation, and also because in some parts of even our grid, um, the a gigawatt is not needed or the grid is not set up for that. So, so there is a very strong interest in small modular reactors, uh, but from what I'm seeing is we're seeing with the uh, unit three at Vogel uh, operational and unit four not far behind it in the state of Georgia, uh, we are hearing more interest even in the United States for the, the gigawatt scale reactors as well. Um, so we're seeing interest in both. Okay, it's your moment Yasser for the micro. So uh, take us away on that in terms of what triggered you to do this and you're doing it out of Austin, te Texas you were telling me uh, today. What stage are we at? And you said you kind of try to fit in that sweet spot between micro and small as we were going to the gents room. It was a quick briefing you gave me. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yes, uh, so I recently uh, I left the National Lab, Idaho National Lab, my bo ex boss is right here, um, uh, and then moved to Allo Atomics. Essentially, what we are trying to do is to develop a 10 megawatt electric system, a micro reactor, well, an SMR as well, because 0 to 10 is where micro reactors lie and 10 to 300 is SMR, so we're right at the cusp, so we can essentially party with both sides. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the idea with that is to bring to fruition um, the promise of micro reactors. But let me start by saying that to actually achieve net zero, we need every size, scale, and shapes of reactors to come to fruition. Um, that includes conventional light water reactors, small modular reactors, including advanced reactors, uh, like what TerraPower is building, uh, as well as micro reactors that fall as a subset of advanced reactors. Now, the opportunity in, in micro reactors, the way I see it, is really riding the learning curve, right? Because if you think about a, a let's say, a small modular reactor, which may take between two to four years or so uh, for one unit construction, by the time you want to learn from the third unit, uh, it's almost a d decade mm. away from there. Uh, whereas in micro reactors, we're trying to build these in factories in hundreds of units so that we can churn to the learning process and really ride the experience curve as quickly as we can. Mm. So we want to learn from something very small uh, and then scale it up to a larger system uh, once we know how to do manufacturing very, very well. The same model has been, uh, there's a lot of examples in non-nuclear industries which, which followed this path. Uh, if you look at Tesla, for example, the first year, in their Fremont facility, they built 20 Model S's, right? But right now, in 13 years later, they have 1.8 million cars coming out of their factories. Right. That's the type of um, paradigm shift that these small microreactors can bring to the table. So when we look at the growth here, I often get the question like, hey, microreactors are only a few megawatts. Can they really make a dent in the whole grand scheme of net zero? Uh, not today, maybe not next year, but if you think about, if we get to the point where we're making hundreds and 200s and 300s of these, they can make a real dent. That's, a, that's essentially how solar entered the market, hmm. right? They did not start on day one as a utility scale, scale system, yeah. right? And now they have become utility scale. Uh, so there's a lot of, we, we don't want to ignore the conventional large scale power plants. We need them to speed up nuclear offtakes. Uh, as well as small modular reactors for the mid-sized markets, um, but we also see a lot of opportunity uh, to grow fast, to learn manufacturing, implement it, uh, and really then move along uh, the cost curve. Good. Very, which stage are you at manufacturing then? Do you want to give the audience a sense how far along you are? Sure. We're actually very early as a company, um, but we are essentially uh, taking the Marvel technology, which is essentially a test reactor, and trying to build a commercial version of it. Uh, so what, you know, a lot of the test data we can leverage, uh, a lot of the process learning uh, and the base technology we can leverage out of Marvel, especially for the safety case. Um, a lot of companies are trying to build or collect data from their first demonstration. 
which we can then provide the, uh, enough evidence to support their licensing basis for a commercial system, we can leverage a lot of that data from the Marvel system. So yes, we are a little bit early stage. Uh, we are uh, in the seed round. Uh, we're going to a Series A um, in January, February timeframe, trying to raise around 40 million to get to the testing phase of the project. So 2024 is all about testing for us okay. um, at full scale. Perfect. The other thing I wanted to bring up with the panel, I'd just like to open up the discussion so we don't have to go by one by one. I is there um, kind of the, the uh, desire to invest in nuclear? I mean, did, we've had some fits and starts, as you know, with solar and wind projects now, and the cost has gone up and the offtake is very low. Uh, what are we seeing in the marketplace for financing from seed capital to larger projects? Not everybody's got a, a, a multi-billion uh, billionaire that can finance uh, uh, the group of Terra Power. But is there a market for this, John? Do you want to kick us off and maybe Bernard can weigh in? Is capital hard to raise to fund innovation and new technologies? So I'll, I'll say as a leader of a government laboratory, I'm right. probably not the most qualified to, to answer that question. But I, I, I will say that it's... Well, you it, see where the ideas come from yeah. and they go from there. I'll, right? still, I'll still comment, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's... there's uh, but. Uh, you know, and they'll, they'll each give their experiences. The, the whole market is changing. Uh, it used to be in the U.S., utilities were the only ones interested in such a system, and that is changing. Um, and, and actually, that's even, even within the utility sector, there's a greater and greater appetite for it, but there's still a lot of positioning where all of them are looking at each other and go, you go first, um, and then I'll follow. That's what's so incredible and, and exciting about the TerraPower project, besides the fact that it's repurposing a coal site, um, and the X Energy project as first movers. Because our, our US utility market, the way we're structured, they're, they're, they're pretty risk averse and very cost sensitive. That's true. And so they're all, they all understand, I think they all understand they need nuclear in their portfolio to reach their, their carbon objectives, but they don't want to go first. Uh, they don't want to incur those first of kind costs. That's actually why I believe there's a lot more interest in the AP1000s having Vogel and others, you know, have that experience that now, you know, whoever comes next can leverage. Uh, and so that's kind of the bigger challenge. There's a, there's actually quite a bit of money on the sidelines, but there's a, a, a hesitancy to, to be going first. But beyond that, we're seeing more and more, and I know we don't, I don't think we have a, you know, anybody that's a direct utility person with us uh, up here on the panel, but uh, we're seeing more and more um, high intensity energy users willing to, t or desiring actually to take it to the grid. So, so not the utility customer, but say the Dow Chemicals for the X Energy example, um, and others that are, that are very interested in um, data servers, or data centers, We heard sorry, from Google AI. this morning, right, on that. Microsoft part. and Google are, are, are communicating their needs um, and their desires relative to carbon free. Other manufacturing, steel was talked about earlier this morning, uh, but semiconductors, uh, as we build out semiconductor manufacturing capability in the U.S. So that's, that's probably enough examples, uh, but there's a whole lot of them that need reliable power coming from sectors that are saying they want it to also to be carbon free. Yeah, it's a narrative I hadn't heard before this sessions, these sessions today, to be honest with you, is that mm -hmm. companies are saying, I need reliable, and I was even making the analogy of you go to countries that are planning for the energy future, right? Because mm -hmm. you need a base mm -hmm. load. Bernard, do you want to jump in? You talked about innovation. Chris, thereafter? Yes. Well, uh, I did want to come back to this financing question because it, it, it's honestly, it's not as simple as you describe. I Just know. having one key investor, okay? There's, yeah. to, to organize one of these first of a kind projects, you have to work with three sources of capital, okay? And for sure, you're going to need a large government investment in the, in the US Department of Energy has funded three companies in, in the billions to try and cover that, you know, that government contribution. Then in any case, you're gonna have kind of a, a first customer who you cannot expect to cover first of a kind costs. And you know, John talked about the regulated utilities in the US and other industrial off takers. They want heat or they want electricity, but it's not their job to cover the first of a kind costs. So, then that third leg of the financing does fall on private investors or, or public markets. Um, at at TerraPAR, we decided to stay uh, private. And you know, as you mentioned, we do have uh, Bill Gates as an investor, 
But we have other serious investors. Uh, we, we raised $830 million last year in a private raise in a, a company called SK in Korea. Um, led the raise with, with Bill Gates, and they came in at $250 million. And that was motivated as a, as a strategic investment. Uh, SK is a, they run the largest refinery in Asia. Uh, they have massive semiconductor facilities, and they want to go emission-free with their facilities. So, uh, and they're interested in the financial return of investing in TerraPower. But it's also that strategic green piece. Um, also, ArcelorMittal, um, who is in the audience, thank you, uh, Arcelor, uh, is also an investor, as well as, uh, uh, as well as HD Hyundai in Korea. So it's um, strategic investors, too, who, who want to be part of the energy transition and, and want to decarbonize their own uh, energy-intensive operations. Great. Uh, do you want to go to the micro side of it, Yasser? Uh, you're, you're at small capital today, but do you see an interest, people willing to take a risk? Yeah, I think first I want to say, you know, I think times have evolved quite a bit in the last, you know, let's say 20, 30 years. Before, nuclear projects used to be, you know, in the billions, and because they were all geared towards large-scale conventional plants, and we didn't see a lot of action from the private equity side of things. No, no. That has changed quite a bit, especially that's another opportunity that micro-reactors allowed is, you know, they're bite-sized development programs, uh, you know, th still there is in the multi-million dollars to get a full project come to fruition, but we're seeing that's within the grasp of venture capitals. For example, we, you know, we're, we're you know, one of our key investors, you know, our, our seed run was led by 50 years. We see a lot of interest from Silicon Valley, um, A16Z, Founders Fund, uh, we're talking to a lot of folks from Google Ventures um, and Valor Equity, for example. They're the early investors in SpaceX and Tesla. So we're seeing a lot of interest from Silicon Valley, you know, other uh, tech areas, trying to take a lot of interest in nuclear, and essentially for this whole reason why we're all here today, right? Um, is trying to see how we can move, transition humanity into a prosperous world, but not really affect the climate as much. But having said that, nuclear is expensive on the grand scheme of things, even for the small scale, we don't try to do things in a shortcut. We still have to do a lot of the similar things as large scale development programs have to do. Um, so having government backing or government grants really help. I know we've seen a lot of great investments in, in TerraPower, X Energy, and other ARDP projects, but to really achieve uh, 3X the amount of nuclear, we need more of those initiatives for the other developers as well. Good. Uh, Bernard, you were, you were talking about extending the life cycle of fuel. I wanted to find out what innovations are waiting for us in waste. I've, I've, I've read and talked to different people who are working on the waste side. So if I ask the average consumer where you get that public advocacy support that we talked about in the last panel, uh, what innovation should we expect in the waste? So, so there are a lot of initiative in France where we recycle. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, there are also uh, uh, pending uh, uh, innovative company working again on the on closing the cycle. So I think a lot of activities there, and uh, the positioning of of Ramatom is we have got accumulated uh, a lot of skills and knowledge o over the years is to make sure those knowledge are there and uh, able to be deployed when such project uh, will come. Uh, and I believe they, they will come. Uh, Great. I'm going to test this a little bit. Uh, I didn't get a chance to bring it up with our Swedish minister, who was very interesting, but he said the impact that Chernobyl and Fukushima had on the mindset of nuclear, which I think is important, and, you know, the lack of public support. But I'd love to hear from you as technology innovators, what impact did it have, if any, on that drive to continue to innovate and come up with new designs, micro-reactors, SMRs, and the rest. Did it delay that cycle? Did we lose time because of that? Do you want to start, John? You're at the, sure. the lab level. Sure, I, I do. I do want to say one thing about financing that I find really interesting, just, just to put it out there. But you said you were a government lab. You I know, didn't want to talk I know. About <laughs> uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Bruce Power just announced... Next thing you know, John Wagner, investment banker. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Bruce Power just announced a nuclear carbon offset protocol that they're working on. So traditionally, nuclear has not had access to that kind of uh, vehicle. And mm. so on the financing side, I just find that interesting. I don't know where it's going to go because I am not 
a finance banker. Right. Um, in terms of what did Fukushima uh, do in particular um, to to R and D and and nuclear acceptance in the uh, in the United States, I can speak mostly to. Certainly, you can see a dip in public acceptance around that period of time. Um, you could you could attribute some of the um, delays in, say, a nuclear renaissance to that. How much is hard to, hard to say for sure. On the R&D side, it actually uh, promoted a, a whole uh, focus on what we call accident-tolerant fuels. So more robust fuel forms to withstand um, loss of coolant, uh, not actually not technically loss of coolant accidents, but, but uh, to deal with those kinds of situations at Fukushima. Uh, evolved in. That actually led to the restart of our transient test reactor and additional testing capabilities that now will support the entire light water reactor fleet. So there were direct repercussions in the R&D portfolio as a, as a result of the Fukushima accident. Very good. I think it also, uh, what the minister was saying to me, is that we lost a lot of time in terms yes. of emissions, which was the, uh, the the bad side of it, right, in terms of that perception. Correct. Chris, you were nodding. I, I'm sure you wanted well, to weigh in. And I also well, wanted to talk to you about your natrium technology as well. Sure, it, your question about innovation in nuclear energy and like how did that happen? Did Fukushima speed it up, slow it down? Uh, I, I think you need to note that uh, the nuclear energy industry was really not innovative for decades because we were risk averse. Um, you know, I'm a product of that industry. I was in the nuclear navy and I worked for several nuclear companies. Uh, in a way, our management culture was don't innovate, D repeat what you did last time. And um, sometime around the early 2000s, people like Bill Gates recognized this. They, they said to themselves, uh, you know, in the US we had 100 reactors that the control rooms had analog controls because we, we didn't want to implement digital controls because we were afraid to work with the regulator. So it was, it was a big problem, but it was also an opportunity. You looked at this whole field that hasn't innovated for 30 years and there's just all these modern tools advanced computer modeling, advanced materials that you can bring. And that's, that's really how TerraPower started was, you know, uh, Bill was a futurist, as were our other founders, and they realized, wow, if we took some existing experience from sodium reactors that have been built in, uh, in, in France and Japan, and we brought, you know, advanced computer modeling, advanced materials, um, we could build commercial reactors that have entirely new capabilities. And uh, to answer the second part of your question on natrium, that, that's how we got started. And um, we had another big innovation just about five years ago. We were already pretty happy with our, our reactor, but one utility after another would come to us and say, hey, we're adding lots of wind and solar. Can you, can you load follow? Meaning, can you, can you change your power quickly? And that's something that nuclear power plants haven't been known for. They're, they're usually base load. They operate at the bottom of the dispatch curve. They sell their power for the cheapest. In fact, they're kind of the lowest price source because they're just running all the time. And uh, our innovators at TerraPower realized, hey, what if we added molten salt storage to our reactor? And, and molten salt storage is proven in the solar industry. And it turns out that system operates at about the same temperature as our reactor. Yeah. So it was, it was a great match. And that fundamentally changes how the natrium reactor works. It, it's why our first utility, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, wants to deploy it in a big way in the Mountain West because they're retiring their coal plants there. They're adding lots of wind, which is great, but wind is intermittent. And, and so natrium is just a great... Um, complement to the wind, and uh, which, which can come or go quite quickly, and we can change power at 10% per minute, so it's, it's really ideal for this, this new grid where, where we've lost a lot of that steady 24-7 coal generation. Good. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add, um, when Fukushima happened, I was essentially in my final year of undergraduate college, ready to join the nuclear force, uh -huh. and then I see this on TV, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, what have I done, right? Um, but then I realized I calmed myself down and I said, you know what, maybe if something like this could have happened, then there is a lot of opportunities for improvement. Um, and that's essentially what drove me mm. to, you know, innovate or to go on the innovation side of the nuclear industry. Uh, but there was, there was going to be a huge renaissance right before Fukushima hit, right? We were planning about, what, 30 plus AP1000s, 
and we're going to have a big boom, and then once Fukushima happened, all the orders were out. Right? Um, it took us a while. It's, it's, it's a, you know, obviously nobody died from the disaster alone directly, yeah. uh, but there was a lot of mass hysteria and public perception got affected. That affects drives policies, drives funding, and drives uh, innovation. So everything got slowed down. It did slow down quite a bit, um, but we are picking up. The world um, you know, do believe that nuclear is needed to move to the future, to achieve net zero, to not continue affecting the planet. So we started, when we started thinking about, okay, you know, for advanced reactors, what are we gonna do about it? What can we do about safety differently than current reactors? Don't get me wrong, by the way. Current reactors are amazing track record on their safety. We have run, what, 350 sub nuclear submarines with zero accidents. All our, besides the major ones that we see on TV, uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, um, and Three Mile Island, all the, the industry as a whole for X amount of years that we have operated has been a very, very good safety record, right? But we wanted to go a little bit one step further. So we said when we wanted to build this new reactor, uh, starting from Marvel, we looked into not just large scale power systems, but how university research reactors operate. Those systems are so safe that we let our you know, uh, students operate those systems. The control rods that essentially keep the reactor safe, we ask the students, hey, draw them out as quickly as you can, and you see a nice big pulse, and there's no boiling of coolant, there's no cladding failure, there's no melting of fuel. That's how, those system, how safe those systems are. And I'm gonna geek out a little bit on this, um, and essentially that's what <laughs> gets me excited. We're using the same exact fuel type, which is the source of that effect. We're not necessarily relying on engineered systems for safety we're relying heavily on the inherent safety of the physics of the material. So the, the fuel that I'm referring to is uranium zirconium hydride. Actually, Framatome uh, fabricates uh, that fuel uh, in joint venture with GA uh, at Trigger International. This fuel, once you heat it up rapidly, it, it you know, within a fraction of a second kills the uh, nuclear reaction. Uh, so it prevents it from overheating, essentially. Right. So it's self-regulating in many ways. If I want a reactor in my backyard, I want to have that feature. Yeah, right? no kidding. <laughs> so, and coupled with a very good coolant to cool things down, like sodium, essentially that's what we're using. Uh, we thought that was a great combination between uh, uranium zirconium hydride fuel and sodium coolant. And so we're essentially not a traditional sodium fast reactor, but we are a sodium thermal reactor that helps us to reduce enrichment, reduce the fuel core size. And if your core is small, everything else follows. And, and everything is smaller, then you're paying less per megawatt uh, for your energy. So I just want to preface by saying, let's not ask nuclear engineers how to make nuclear sexy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first step. Um, and I think... Uh, Who should we ask, by the way? <laughs> that's a good point. Actually, uh, you can ask uh, my partner here, uh, Matt Lozak. He's from the non-nuclear industry, but he is leading uh, the nuclear company here. And he brings a lot of insights into like, you know, some of the things that are actually missing. Um, but I do want to applaud the advocacy group because they have been amazing the last few years and have really bridged a lot of the gap between the nuclear, hardcore nuclear folks uh, and the public, the general public, who does not really know a lot about nuclear. Like, they don't understand. That's why some, when you don't know something about very well, you're inherently going to fear it way higher than the reality is. And that's what's driving per public perception. So I think we need to hire a lot of younger people and a lot of folks that are non-engineers to really see how to actually engage the newer generation. And we've seen today, this morning, majority of the nuclear supporters are actually the younger generation. Those are our customers. Those are the folks that we need to educate and reach out to and engage um, so that we can make nuclear sexy again, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's non-traditional thinking to that. How do we go about you know, making uh, interesting uh, transparency videos in Twitter or TikTok, right? It, it, there is a communication uh, effort that's needed. Yeah. It, it's often the case where people try to say, I do my business well and I don't need to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think it's a new generation. We're a little bit tight. I'm going to go to Bernard if, you don't, if that's okay. Sure. Bernard, please. So, so I think uh, what we can do is to make it happen because, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that's what we do. So we're currently ramp up to, to supply 3.5 gigawatt per year. So we already invested 1 billion euros in the past five years. We're in the process of investing additional 1 billion in three years. We hire 
to, to supply the EPRs, new, new world, the, the French SMR, but also to position us as supplier of technology bricks and uh, equipments for all the projects. Then we hire people. The plan for this year is to hire 2,000 people. We already hired 2.2 thousand this morning and we'll continue. And uh, make the link between the climate change, the, the sovereignty, and, uh, and people are, are attracted for, by, by that. Do it in safety, in quality, and, and lead time. And as you do that, you mobilize the people, you engage them. But it's not enough. It's important to also work with the supply chains because we, we need all the, the, the supply chain to be engaged and, uh, and deploy this work together with, with the supply chain. So I think it is happening and our responsibility is to, ma to make it happen and make it a success. Great, very clear with your thoughts. Thank you for that. Um, you said on time, because this is a, one of the legacy challenges of building huge projects, because sometimes they slide, then the taxpayer gets very upset about it, right? So it's a very good point. Chris, you're gonna finish this here. Yeah, on motivating the young people, I, I think we're already making a lot of progress because uh, young people are so climate focused, they realize nuclear is emissions free, but we, we still have to, keep going with good, clear communications. It turns out the nuclear industry often in the past talked in their own lingo, talked over people's heads. Um, you know, my, my boss, Bill Gates, in his book, uh, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, he talks to people, you know, assuming that not everybody has a master's degree in engineering or science, you know, like 10th grade science level class is, is the right way to talk to people. Um, so we need, to, we need to keep working on that. And, I do want to address your question about the race, right? Um, you know, it, it turns out the state-owned companies, uh, in some cases, are ahead of the free world uh, companies in these nuclear projects. China has several commercialized Gen 4 reactors already. Uh, Russia has a sodium cooled reactor, um, you know, a little bit like ours. And I would say that um, public-private partnerships uh, are much more effective and innovative than state-owned, state-controlled bureaucracies. To have this mix of national labs and innovative companies like TerraPower, um, you know, I, I think with that kind of construct, we can, we can run circles around state-run bureaucracies. It's interesting, it came up time and time again during our first week at COP28. Uh, a lot of people think that PPPs are a bunch of nonsense, but uh, you can deploy faster with that sort of collaboration between a lab and the private sector. I, I also, just to add to the lingo that we use in the nuclear sector, I would say that even the lingo we use around COP doesn't connect to the average <laughs> citizen. Nobody knows what a global stock take is and net zero by 2050 and uh, the race to 1.5, which needs to be translated in the States into Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. I think they could do a much better job as a communicator to pull the next generation along uh, for the ride. A lot of people say, let's go to electrification. I was talking to my daughters who are 21 and 18, and they said, I said, how about the source of energy into the power plant? They're like, what are you talking about? I said, not if there's stuff in it full of coal, right? You could use nuclear uh, or solar or wind. Uh, yeah, because I really compliment the organizers of this net zero uh, nuclear. It's a fantastic program, number one. Uh, number two, it's great to have such great minds and to finish on technology and innovation, which we appreciate. And congratulations again, uh, Your Excellency, for the announcement and building that coalition along with the World Nuclear Association. That was quite a major breakthrough. I kind of gauged it at a studio we were running at COP28, and people that don't know energy, and I love energy, but they didn't know energy, they said, that's quite a big move. There's all these countries behind it. It's quite a big movement in the last five years in the industry. So thank you. Uh, nice round of applause for the panelists, and thanks for the invitation. Thank you, John.